There we go. I mean, I did give her explicit instructions, be mean to the students, so I mean, there's that, but okay. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, I thank you uh, for this class and for this opportunity we just have to, uh, to meet and study your creations, pray you to guide our steps today, help us to glorify you, what we do, and just to understand this idea of uh, conformal mapping and how it solves all kinds of problems. In the name of my prayer, Lord Jesus, amen. All right, so let me give you the big idea first. So ultimately, the problem we face today is this. We want to solve Laplace's equation in the z-plane. Okay, so in the z-plane, if we use z equals x plus iy, then this is like phi xx plus phi yy is equal to zero. All right? And so complex analysis is going to help us with this because we know that the component functions to a complex differentiable function are harmonic, right? So the component functions um, are harmonic, which is great. And, and, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more than this. We want to solve this in the z-plane subject to um, some boundary conditions, right? So essentially, the idea is, in the z-plane, we have something like, I don't know what it is exactly, but um, let me not draw it so complicatedly. I don't know. Maybe, eh. So we might, I don't know, we might, we might want to try to solve it on I don't know, some kind of weird, like this, right? And maybe, maybe, maybe you're trying to solve Laplace's equation on this space and you've got like, you know, you got phi equals to one here, you got phi equals to two here, you got phi equals to three over here, um, you know, phi is equal to four in this part and phi is equal to five down here, that makes sense. So you're trying to, you know, so like phi equals one from here to here, and phi equals to three like up here. All right, phi equals to five, just maybe this part, all right? And phi equal to four over here. So my, my point is you've got some given set of boundary conditions You've got values you want your solution, you, you want your solution to Laplace's equation to satisfy those boundary conditions on the edge of the region that you have in mind to solve Laplace's equation, all right? And <clears throat> here's the cool thing, is if you can take this, all right, and you can take some function f, right? And so here you've got typical point z, right? And we have w is f of z. So over here you've got the w plane, right? And over here, maybe it makes it into, I don't know, something like, something really nice and simple like a half plane, right? And the half plane is such that, um, oh man, I lost a, well I guess that's black. So, um, could be, so like the green part maps onto this, all right? If you could find, if you can find a, a function f so that the green part maps onto that part such that the red part, uh, the first red part maps onto that and then the black part maps onto the next piece, right? And then the, the next red part here maps onto this piece maybe and then, um, then we're, we're, we're to the purple part and so that purple part's going to go out all, all the way out, all right? So that keeps going and going all the way out to infinity. Just like this green case goes all the way out that way to infinity. The same infinity. Basically what I'm proposing is that we're looking for a map that takes this point right here, let's say P and F of P is infinity. So the purple case and the, and the green case 
somehow they meet at infinity under this, this map, all right? Hypothetically. All right, so, and furthermore, good grief. I'll tell you what. <clears throat> hmm. 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 I have ideas. Anyway, I'm um, keep them to myself. So if 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 they're going that way, right? Did I do it that way? Wait a minute. I went green to I did the other way, didn't I? Oh, rats. Well, I mean, it's not bad. It's just. Uh, oh man, now I'm breaking my brain. <sighs> so, if I want to go, if I want to start with the purple and go that way, then I, I need. To, I want. I want to talk about the interior of this region as the thing. Okay, guys. So, like the interior of this region. Yeah. I have to kind of go like that, right? Around the edge. So that means if I start with the purple, then I go to the red, then I go to the black, and then I go to the red, then I go to the green. So this way corresponds to this direction on the boundary with my color coding, which means we're mapping to the either, what, the upper half plane or the lower half plane? Lower. Lower half plane, right. So, all right, anyway. So that, if we could find, and <laughs> by the way, we're not going to find such an F. But there are techniques to do it. <laughs> if you look in the red book, there are formulas to straight up map some monstrosity like this <laughs> to a half plane. There are particular numerical calculations you can do to make it happen. All right, that's not something I teach. I just it's there to look up. All right. Um, anyway, if you have this mapping F, right? And then, if you can solve Laplace's equation over here in the W plane, right? And this I actually will show you, that we can solve in the W plane, let's say psi, um, nabla squared psi equals to zero. But in, in detail, that means like psi uu plus psi vv equals to zero. If I can find a solution psi over here, right, such that psi is equal to four here and psi is equal to, um, how's it go, three and psi is equal to, and the black it was two, the another red was one, the purple I had it equal to five, right? If I can find a solution like that, that takes those values on the boundary, then check this out. F um, composed with psi no, my, my, I'm, I'm sorry, other way around. Psi, if I, I put phi equal to F composed with psi. I'm, I'll, I'll get it eventually, guys. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. If I put phi is equal to psi composed with F. All right. Now, for the sake of convenience, suppose for a second that psi is a complex function. Suppose psi is a complex solution. Um, complex differentiable function, right? Suppose psi is a complex differentiable function, that would make this also a complex differentiable function, right? And see how this works? So like psi, phi of z is psi of f of z. Why is phi complex differentiable? If f, if f is complex differentiable and psi is complex differentiable, then the composition of complex differentiable functions is complex differentiable, right? Which means that phi satisfies the Laplace equation because every complex differentiable function is harmonic. And more than that, um, phi so constructed, so understand this, I'm using the solution over here to construct the solution over there. This will solve Laplace's equation subject to the boundary conditions. Now, typically, what we do is we don't use it, we don't look at a whole we don't look at like a complex solution over here. We look at like you know the real part or the imaginary part of psi. And so, if you just take the real part of both sides, we get 
a real solution to Laplace's equation built from a real solution over there, or the imaginary part, all right? So the game we need to think about playing is given some kind of, you know, um, region in the z-plane, can we find a mapping, a conformal mapping, because this works best when f prime of z is not zero, all right? So can we find a conformal mapping? Although I don't think this really presupposes that f prime is not zero. I don't see why f prime equal to zero would necessarily, they wouldn't put a wrinkle in the plans here. But however, this much is true. If f prime of z is, is equal to zero, then it's not, it doesn't have to be conformal there. So all kinds of weird stuff can happen at a point where the derivative is zero. All bets are off. If the derivative of f is non-zero, then we have other things like perpendicular lines mapped to perpendicular lines over there, all right? Um, <clears throat> so here's the idea. We need to figure out, can we find, um, there's, two, there's two things, there's two tasks, right? One of the tasks is to find nice solutions to common geometric shapes for Laplace's equation with values on the boundary, all right? That's what the handout's going to do for us. I stole these things from Nagel Safin-Snyder's book. Excuse me, Safin-Snyder. Nagel's in the differential equations, but not in the uh, complex book. Um, my bad. And then I'm not even going to tell you how to find the f that makes this wackad wackadoodle star thing over there. That's, I think, like, um, oh, goodness, what are those things called? If you look in here, there's pictures. Um, What's that called? I think it's a Schwartz Christoffel. If you look on like page 229, see that? It deals with such things. It's in books. You can take a look. So <clears throat> let us talk about then the method. You got it? You sure? I can do that. <laughs> when students mess with the uh, Zoom, it invariably ends up with the camera getting turned off. And then I miss half of a lecture, and, and that is sad. Technically, the Zoom works. But yeah, it's okay. There you go. Good enough. Um, okay, so. This is just a review of everything we just talked about, all right? And um, <clears throat> I will, I could tell you about why Laplace's equation is interesting. Let me do that. I'll spend like 20 whole seconds of class doing that, if, that, if that's okay with you guys. Um, if I can find my laser. Oh man. I got no laser. I got to have my laser. Ah. Yes. So Laplace's equation appears in fluid physics, in the heat equation, um, in electrostatics. These are very common applications. There, there are like at least a dozen common applications of Laplace's equation. For the heat equation, the heat equation says that the flow, this U is the temperature. So the temperature in a given solid is, the rate of change of the temperature is proportional to the Laplacian acting on the temperature function because this basically describes the diffusion of heat throughout the solid. And so in the case that after a long time, after a long time has passed, all of the change in temperature has washed out, partial U, partial T is zero, which then gives you Laplace's equation as the steady state solution of the heat equation. So solving Laplace's equation is finding steady state solutions to the heat equation. Um, it also appears in fluid physics. I have less to say about that. Although um, you can talk about the stream function and anyway, there's lots to say there, but um, Students, I, I have tried this in past semesters, and no one's math majors just look at me and go, "Huh?" Well, you're asking those uh, I know. <laughs> you're like, they're like, they're like, they look, they look distrustful. They, they, they're like, "Is this physics? Are you doing physics in here? How dare you?" You know, like that's the vibe I usually get. But um, <laughs> anyway, I do do some physics sometimes. Electrostatics, the electric field is minus the derivative of the voltage. And so like the voltage in the absence of charge has to solve the Laplace's equation. If there's charge, you actually get a minus charge density divided by epsilon naught over there, which is Poisson's equation, which is another matter. But Laplace's equation is the kind of thing you have to solve for like voltage, the voltage function on a, on a charge plate, something like that. 
So anyway, the applications of what we're doing are vast, all right? That's why this um, material is required for some engineering programs and why your textbook has a very engineering bent, right? Which you guys are not super happy. I won't use this textbook again. You, sorry. Um, I, 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 the people have spoken. I, I will change. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so, so here's like my less complicated picture. Like you have this region, you're trying to map to that region such that you have phi equals one here, maps to psi equals to one there, something like that. All right, this is the idea. So <clears throat> template solutions. Here's some nice standard go-to easy solutions. If you want to solve Laplace's equation on an, on a, on an annulus, all you got to do is like a constant natural log of the modulus of z minus c naught plus b. This is harmonic because it's the real, it's the real part of, um, it's the real part of like uh, the log, the complex logarithm shifted. Well, that's holomorphic, remember, everywhere. The, the problem with the complex logarithm is that it's got the angle jump, right? So it's in the imaginary part. So the real part of the complex log logarithm is actually, um, it's actually holomorphic on the whole plane without, without the origin, right? So this will not be, this won't work at Z naught, of course. And then you just shift to put the center, but, but there it is. So if you're solving on an annulus, so like one of your homework problems is just literally that, right? Which one is it, Ernesto? 162. Yeah, 162 is literally nothing more than taking that template and choosing an A and B to make it work. It's that simple. I'm so sorry that I made it that easy. I'll do better. Look at the quiz. So um, <clears throat> I'm not. I don't think the quiz is impossible. I, I, that seems like something I shouldn't say. That, that, that feels like if I say something's not impossible and it's not difficult, doesn't that like make it become more difficult just as a matter of like circumstance or something? Well, you said it was an old test, right? Uh, parts of it are from an old test, yes. yes. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so, uh, Um, so here, if I want phi equals to 10 on the radius 1 circle centered at 1, and if I want phi equals to 30 on the radius 2 circle centered at, at uh, 1, then I just choose an A and a B to make it so. I, I make 10 equal to A log 1 plus B, but log of 1 is 0, so it gives me B is 10. 30 is A log 2 plus, so that gives me 20 over log 2, and plug them back in, there you go. That right there, what, 10 over log 2, natural log of... Um, <clears throat> x minus 1 squared plus y squared plus 10, you might wonder where did that 20 go? I put a 2 in there to change a square root to a square because, you know, who wants a square root? But check it out. That's a solution to Laplace's equation on the annulus, putting 10 on the inside and 20 on the outside. Now you might not have, if I hadn't told you this trick, that would have been a kind of, maybe that would have taken you a while to think of that, right? But now that you know it, you can solve problems on an annulus, no problem, right? And a sector or a wedge, also, we've got some canned solutions for that. If I want to solve, um, you know, solve Laplace's equation on the, some, some sector like that, I can just use an argument which is shifted. So, like this one, I want to basically go from 3 pi over 4 to 5 pi over 4 using the standard angle, right? So um, if my z naught is 3 plus i, I do, I decided to use Argo, like the uh, one centered at, uh, starting at 0. Oh, look, my conventions have changed. Check it out. When I wrote this handout, I was including, I was including the upper end, not the lower end. Isn't that lovely? So my definition has changed since I wrote this. My apologies. So not really. I don't care. Um, no, I care a little bit. Duh. Anyway, I'll get over it. Um, so I need 20 to be when I put 3 pi over 4, and I need 30 to be when I put 5 pi over 4. Two equations, two unknowns, you solve them, and there it is. Phi of z is 20 over pi, um, you know, the angle of the point z minus 3 minus i, and all that I got shifted by 5. Now, if you actually work that out, <clears throat> in terms of a formula for inverse tangent might be a little bit trickier. I think this works. 
if we do pi plus the inverse tangent of um, y minus 1 over x minus 3, I think that's correct here. So, um, but anyway. The plus pi is because we're over here, so I have to add, if I add, so like, uh, since these are negative, since we're, like, the, the negative angles, I think, well, are we negative? I don't know. I, I'm not super trustful of this formula, honestly. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong about that. So I, be, be suspicious of this formula. Let me not belabor that part. Uh, <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so, the larger point here, why is that a, so the question though, I, I mean I just said it's a solution to Laplace's equation, why is it a solution to Laplace's equation? Because it's the imaginary part of the log alpha, right? And that is the imaginary component to um, a complex differentiable function provided I'm not on a region which encircles the origin, right? So like if I'm in a sector, as long as the branch cut is not in the middle of the sector, then I can use arg alpha as a solution to Laplace's equation. And if that works, then a constant plus, it, basically if you have a solution to Laplace's equation, you can always take it, multiply by a non-zero number, and add a constant to it to shift it around. Like it's still a solution to Laplace's equation. That's easy to prove. Um, any questions? So. It's already posted. It's been posted for like a week. Yeah. You said that solves Laplace's equations because that's the imaginary part of a homomorphic equation. Right, that is the. satisfies the Cauchy ring. That is right. That is right. right. Yeah, it's the imaginary component of a holomorphic function, therefore, satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations, right. therefore, implies the Laplace equation solution. Yeah. Um, we can also write down a solution to Laplace's equation on like a, a slab like a strip, if I want 4 down here and I want 3 up here for x plus 2 um, and x plus 1, right, these are parallel lines. Um, some of you are taking a course where you're thinking about parallel lines a lot. There's a couple of ones right there. Look at how easy those are to describe with equations. For hundreds of years we've known about equations. Why? Why is it so hard to write down equations for lines? Why wouldn't we be? Because it's possible for it not to be. It's possible, but we've already defined the dot product, and so, you know, we've got Euclidean geometry. People are so noisy today. All right, so anyway, basically the template for something like this is M um, times your equation that describes the line in this case. Well, anyway, I mean AX plus BY plus N, so I just, I can figure out what the, um, well, what you do is you just put the A and the B to match up with the equation. So this is like, you know, uh, Y minus X equals to 2. This is Y minus X equal to 1. So I just put a Y minus X in to mimic the uh, equations for the line like that, and then I choose M and N um, that make it give me 4 here and 3 there, which ends up being this. Anyway, there you go. There's that. Here's another one. So like, um, so if you have a vertical strip, a little bit different. If I want pi for my boundary condition here, 7 over there, I do something like mx plus n and then solve my equations and out pops 7 minus pi over 3 times x plus 2 pi minus 7. You can easily see that if you twice differentiate this res with respect to x, what do you get? Zero. And what's the y derivative? Zero. So is phi x x plus phi y, y equal to zero? Yep. So it's a solution to Laplace's equation. And you can easily plug in x equals to three and see that you get uh, pi. And if you plug in x equal to seven, um, you better get, uh, oh, excuse me, x equal to six, then you'll get, um, Apparently 7. Oh yeah, the minus 2 pi is the cancel, and then I get plus 14 and minus 7, which gives, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, the formula works. All right, anything else here? If you want a half plane, right? And suppose you want to solve Laplace's equation in the half plane. 
well, argument's a good choice here, so A argz plus B, and um, zero is the place where we're changing from pi to zero, so we'll, we'll center it at zero. And um, so let's see here, I get, um, um, why do I have zero here? So basically, if we put in phi of anything here, um, like phi of minus one, excuse me, phi of minus i. For instance, phi of minus i would be pi, excuse me, zero. And the uh, angle for minus i is minus pi over two, so that's why I put a minus pi over two there. On the other hand, if I plugged in i, like phi of i should be pi according to my assumption, but the angle for i would be pi over two, so I get that. And then again, two equations, two unknowns, out pops this. And you can easily check that this formula right here will output a pi if we're up here, and it'll output a zero if we're down there, because down here the angle is minus pi over two, so minus pi over two plus pi over two is zero. Up here, the angle is pi over two, so pi over two plus pi over two is pi. It works. And the fact that it's solution to Laplace's equation is perhaps less obvious, but it works. Now, you can also use inverse cotangent, like this. So if I want to solve like an upper half plane, you guys might like to know about the inverse cotangent. It's nice to know about that for the purpose of an example like this. Um, so check this out. If I, um, huh, I seem to be back to example one again. So if I take the right half plane and I rotate by I, which is to rotate by 90 degrees, right? I get that. And so like, Notice that i times i is minus 1, and minus i times i is 1. So this green, the blue part, excuse me, blue part, what's wrong with me? The red part maps to this red part. The green part maps to that green part. Um, and 0 maps to 0. Um, now I'm assuming that the values that I want for my, my solution are 0 and pi. So um, basically I want to use argw. Um, where that's zero and that's pi. So that's the principal argument. Make sense? Make, does it make sense? So my solution, so now this is actually an example, so transitioning here. Up to the last about 10 minutes or so, I've been showing you template solutions, like go-to template solutions. This is actually an example of conformal mapping. I'm showing you how to take the solution over in the W plane and translate back and get a solution over here. All right. Now that's kind of silly because, of course, you could just use the same kind of template to do this one anyway. So it's a kind of dumb example, but it, it nevertheless illustrates the idea. So <clears throat> arg w solves it up here. Phi of z, arg of iz. See, that's that my f of z is iz, so I plug that in here. And what is iz? Well, it's so like phi of i is arg of ii, which is arg of minus one, which is pi, which is what I want. And um, down down here phi of minus i is arg of, uh, is, 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 is arg of 1, which is 0. So um, yeah, I've solved the, um, the boundary value problem I wanted. Now what's a formula? What's a formula for the argument of w on the upper half plane? Maybe that's something you haven't thought about. How would you write a formula that, would, re, that would, would give you angles between 0 and pi for the argument. We can't use inverse tangent on the whole upper half plane because it only works for positive x. It's got a, a divergence on the y-axis, right? But if you instead use, that's supposed to be, there's no h here. What, what, what seriously, anyway, scratch that h out. No? Okay. Oh, look, it's gone down here. It worked. So, um, and over here too. So, theta inverse cotangent of x over y. This guy has a problem when y is equal to zero, which is the edge of the half plane, which I'm using the argument, right? So, like, if you want a formula for upper half plane, you can use you can use the inverse cotangent, see? And inverse cotangent, so, well, okay, so here's where it gets dicey. Did you guys know that there are two popular definitions of inverse cotangent? 
there are. Look it up on Wikipedia. Half the people use what I do, and half of the people do some kind of weird thing where it's got a jump, and it's like they are looking at the local inverse of the inverse cotangent like here and there. So their, their inverse cotangent, it's like the reflection of this, just this piece over here. I, I don't like their version. We're using our version because it gives us a nice continuous assignment of angle from zero to pi, which is wonderful, which is what we'd like. One uniform formula for the angle on the upper half plane. That's what this gives us, which is nice. And so, in short, this produces inverse cotangent of y over x. And if you try that out, it works if you look at the properties of inverse cotangent, which maybe you don't know about, but here they are. Inverse cotangent of minus infinity is pi. Inverse cotangent of infinity is 0, as it's constructed by me with a typo of at h. All right, let me move on. This right here, ooh, this is very cool. So check this out. If we want to solve Laplace's equation in this upper half plane such that I have boundary values 1 here, 2 here, 3 there, and 4 there, we can do it by just adding angle functions based at the points where you're jumping from one case to the next. Like, check out how this works. Let me just explain each case. So like the purple case, if we're beyond 1, right, think about this, if we're beyond 1, that means we're, where the coordinates are positive with respect to the center of 1, of 0, of minus 1, right? All of the angle, like arg of z plus 1, z and z minus 1, they're all looking at the argument of a positive number. So the angle is 0 in every case, all right, in the purple case. The ang all of these are 0. And so <clears throat> that means that phi of z is equal to just b. And we're, we're, wanting, we're, we're specifying that to be 1. So that forces my, my b to be 1 from that case. Now, when we're in the green case, the argument based at 1 now has a negative input. So that makes this one pi. But these are still 0. So then we have, um, you know, when this formula, put in this formula, we get a3 times pi plus b equal to, that would be a 2. Sorry, I got cut off in the scan. And so you solve that, and um, that gives me a3 is uh, 2 minus 1, which is 1, 1 over pi. That's my a3, my coefficient here. Next, we're in the, um, we're in the, in the red. In the red, we've got only the z plus 1 is 0, but these are both pi. So that gives us, you know, a, a2 pi plus 1 over pi times pi, because remember, we just found a3 is 1 over pi plus the b, which was 1, solve for a2, we get a2 is 1 over pi. All right, great. And then finally to the orange case, when all of the arguments written here, all three of them, are all equal to pi, plug it in, and that gives us that a1 is 1 over pi. So lo and behold, there is a solution to Laplace's equation, all right, on the upper half plane, where what? Where you've got 4, 3, 2, 1 like that. Now, if you want an actual formula for this, you could use the inverse cotangent. You could use the inverse cotangent for these arguments, all right, with the appropriate understanding, like this is x plus 1 plus iy. So inverse cotangent would have to be based on, like, the appropriate ratio of x plus 1 and y. This one would have to be based on the appropriate ratio of x and y. This one would be based on the appropriate ratio of x minus 1 and y, because z minus 1 has real part x minus 1, imaginary part y. There's nothing stopping you from doing this for 20 cases. And you guys know how to take a fractional linear transformation, like a Mobius transformation, and take this line and like wrap it around a circle, right? So if you did that, then you could have a solution to Laplace's equation where you have 20 different boundary values on different parts of the circle. Which is like, I don't know, I think it's pretty cool. I actually put that into practice right here. So. Here is um, a, a circle of radius uh, 1, centered at 1. And I mapped that to this guy right here by 2i over z plus 1. So you can see that, like, does this map to there? I think it does. 
I hope it does. That's my picture. You guys tell me if I'm right or wrong. Well, if the circle goes, if the circle goes through the origin, it maps to a line, right? Under, under a, um, a reciprocal map. Like the reciprocal map, if you have a circle which goes through the origin, it maps to a line. Um, so like the zero maps to infinity. Um, two maps to one plus i. And um, one plus i, through this little math here, maps to two, pl two plus i. So apparently this is the line like v equals to one in the w plane. V equals to one, u is free, the horizontal line in the w plane. And, um, all right, so what did I do here? Did I change it at all? Instead of doing plus one, what did I do? Minus i. Now what, the, what would the plus one do? If you think about it, that just shifts it. See what, see what happens, the only difference is like the if you can imagine this, not adding the one, adding the one like pushes these three points over. So if I don't add the one, it shifts it one this way. So those three points go to dip, 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 dip. And then I subtract I, subtracting I rather than not subtracting I, takes that line and moves it down to here, if that makes sense. So although I, I, I don't have a formula in view right now, so my bad. Sorry, I'm going to show you so much at once. So this, this, um, Mobius transformation maps this circle to that line. But we know how to write down Laplace's equation solution here, right? We just take the argument, argument, argument plus one, basically by the same calculation I just did. So now we have a solution to Laplace's equation in the W plane, all right? And so how do I get the solution over here that has values one, two, three, four? You know, one, two, three, and four. How do you do it? You just compose the solution in the W plane with F, just like that. And this right here would be a solution, and not would be, it is a solution to Laplace's equation on the disk, modulus of z minus one equals to one, which has these four boundary conditions on the edge. This is the technique of conformal mapping. Now, to actually find the formulas for this, that would be a pain in terms of x and y, but you could do it. You just have to find the real and imaginary parts and perhaps use the inverse cotangent if you like it. All right. Whoa, this example is from Saf and Snyder. Example one um, from page 420 of Saf and Snyder. This, this example, I was just like, dang. I, I don't know, this, this, I'm impressed with this example. This example is just, it's dastardly. And it, it illustrates some ideas which I haven't talked enough about yet. Um, so mapping lines to lines and lines to circles, circles to lines, that gets you a long way. But there's another thing that you can take advantage of as you're constructing maps to take one region to another, which is the fact that if the map is conformal, it has to maintain angles. So if there is like a set of perpendicular curves in the domain, it has to map to a corresponding set of perpendicular curves in the codomain, in the target space. So like here, maybe you can't see this, maybe you can. See these two circles? They intersect in a perpendicular, right? So whatever this point maps to, if you follow like the image of the circle and the image of the upper circle, um, under the conformal map, then that should give us a pair of perpendicular lines in the target space. And likewise for that point of intersection. So um, that might help motivate where this formula comes from. I don't know. <laughs> um, you can see where this formula comes from if you think about it. What's this, what's this formula doing? Can you guys kind of talk me through the logic of this formula? You've worked some of the homework, I think, with the Mobius transformation, some of you at least. This maps what? Zero to zero. So we're, we're mapping zero to zero. We chose to do that. Listen, you could map this region to whatever you want. You can map it to whatever you want. 
but you better choose something that you know how to solve Laplace's equation on. We know how to solve Laplace's equation on sectors, on half planes, and on annuli. That's all we know. Is more known? Oh yes, much more is known, but those are what we know. All right, so we'll stick with that for now, maybe forever. <laughs> um, and so like the, the, uh, the intention here is to take this and map it to like a, a quarter plane. So once you decide that, you might as well make the quarter plane go to the origin. And so mapping zero to zero makes a nice formula. So why, don't, why not just anchor the whole formula to that? Zero maps to zero, starting point, right? Now if zero maps to zero, um, then that means that this, there's two things going on here, right? The one is that this red circle through the origin has to map to something, right? And the other is that the purple circle through the origin has to map through something. But if, um, uh, I'm trying to think here, how to see, uh, there's something I'm, I, I, I should, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see a reason that we must be mapping both of those to lines. There's got to be a reason to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on why I should say that. But they do, map, they do need to both map the lines. And if that's the case, those lines need to be perpendicular. Because these circles are perpendicular at this point of intersection. Yes? If they both pass through the point 1 plus i, then they both map that point to infinity. So they both Say that again? Um, since they both pass through the point 1 plus i, their mm -hmm. denominator is both 0. Oh, oh yes. Point, so Granted, uh, um, totally agree, but I'm trying to, I, I, I haven't explained the game I'm trying to play. Okay, so I'm, trying to play I'm trying to play the game where we don't know this. Oh, okay. So like, I'm starting with the logic, we're going to send 0 to 0. That just gives me z upstairs. I don't know what to put downstairs yet. You're right. Once I write, once I write that, you're totally exactly right. That makes both. That makes one plus i map to infinity, which is good. If these are both lines, then they meet at infinity, uh, at one intersection point, and they meet at the origin at their other intersection intersection point, which is exactly what happens here. I guess the point is, is that's one possible mapping that you could think of, and that's enough. Right. But I, 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 listen, I guys, I freely admit that this to me is a very challenging aspect of this whole enterprise is how do you write down this map, okay? That's very challenging. Um, so one way to make the uh, test question like much easier is just to tell you to study a particular map and how conformal mapping works with respect to that map. Like, I can take 95% of the difficulty of the problem out by just giving you the mapping and asking you to construct the solution in light of that, you know. But anyway, so this, whatever this is called, this lemon-shaped thing, maps to that quarter of the, of the complex plane, in the W plane, right? But we can write down the solution to Laplace's equation over here by using the shifted, uh, like the multiplied argument function, right? Like, here it is. So argument of minus two over pi, time, minus two over pi times the argument plus five halves, that gives you the values we wanted on the edge of the quarter, set, the quarter plane. And then when you work out the real and imaginary parts of the uh, Mobius transformation, you get apparently V, well, they're kind of ugly. The, the imaginary part is x minus y over the denominator. The uh, real part is x times x minus 1 times y plus y times y minus 1 divided by the ugly denominator. The cool thing is when you take the quotient of the imaginary and the real part of the w, the denominator would be canceling and you're just left with that. And so when we use, um, and we can use arg sub 0 over there, and I, I, I say that pi plus inverse tangent works. I 
I hope that's true. I really should stop and think about it. I don't want to think about it right now, but you can debate me as to whether or not that formula is legit. I, I hope it is. If it is legit, if this is a legitimate argument, um, le legitimate formula for the argument is based at zero in quadrants um, two and three, then this is straight up the f solution of Laplace's equation in that funny lemon, lemon wedgy looking thing. I don't know, I, I, I personally find this whole program just very fiendishly clever. I mean, this whole idea, it's so cool. Um, let's see here. So here I think I'm just checking my work. All right. So one of the homework problems I got out of, um, oops, where is it? I got it out of Saf and Snyder, which I think I have open. Where'd it gone to? Well, that's it, but I had Saf and Snyder open. Is it this one? Yeah, there it is. So, no, that's the answers. So the, um, <clears throat> the answer to um, the first one that I have a picture of is this. 2 over pi, 1 plus c, 1 minus c. Um, let me talk about this one. It's a little bit more interesting. Um, well, maybe I should talk about, talk about both of them. I'm starting to run out of run out of steam here. Uh, where my mission gone to? So this one here. Um, see, it's not quite like the other ones that I have shown you. Like I showed you one where we mapped a disk to a half plane last class, right? But this is a half disk. So what's, what's the idea you can use here? I mean, if we could map this um, to a sector, we'd be good, right? So you got, you got zero down here. Um, from minus one to one, you've got a, a half half circle. Um, radius one, you want so up here is I, right? Let's see here. So what did what, what were the values we wanted? Phi equals to what? Phi equals to zero here and phi equal to one up there. How should we, how should we do this? What's, I mean, if we, if we choose, I think we can map it into like a quarter plane. Yeah. Because it's, it's conformal, right? Okay. Or maybe. Yeah. Sure. The, the perpendicular at, um, Which are perpendicular? Your the, the the half where the circle's cut off into a half circle should be perpendicular. Right. And um, Yeah, yeah, exactly. The 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 half circle and the diameter they meet perpendicularly. And there's two intersection points, right? So one of them we're going to have to send to infinity. Or let me say it this way. We can send one of them to infinity. And we can send the other one to a finite point of our choosing. Well I would like to send it to zero. That's right. So let us look. So what we want is we want f of minus 1 to be infinity. We want f of 1 to be zero.
something over z plus 1. So maybe z minus 1 over z plus 1. Of course, we can multiply that by a constant and still achieve those two goals. If we do write this down, where does it send i? I guess I don't know without some calculation, right? <laughs> I minus 1 over I plus 1. Zero. I sure hope not. Oh, wait, no, it doesn't. Let's see here. <laughs> so, it's, I, I, I think it sends me to, uh, oh, I think it sends me to minus I. Is that right? Well, I don't like that. I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm going to flip it. Yeah? Is it okay? Yeah, if you flip it, it should not have the both through So if I send f of z, I forgot what I wrote. Rats. <laughs> All right, so then if I plug in i into that, I get, I get i, right? Uh, did I just do the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> Good. <laughs> there we go. All right, so, so we got that, yeah? Um, I, 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 you, you check me on this, is that right? Okay, good. I mean, I could go get, I was working this with, with Ernesto <laughs> earlier, so I should, should remember it, but I, I don't entirely. Um, that will send minus 1 to 0, and it'll send 1 to infinity, right? Let's see here. So let's think about that. Yes. So um, f of minus 1 is 0. F of i is i, right? We know it's mapping to a line, right? I mean, what happens to line? So th this line maps to a line, right? And so, like, it's got to look like that. Because it, 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 two, we have two points. We have zero, and we have i. They're both on the image of the of the uh, the half circle, so it forces it to be that. And but it's a conformal map. So we, we if we can, uh, where does this have to go? The it has to be perpendicular. You've got either it's either over here or it's over there. But we can easily check something like. Let's, you know, let's just figure it out. What's, what's f of 0 equal to? Aw, oh, man. Seriously? That's not what I wanted. Son of a gun. Fine. It is what it is. Apparently, it's like that. Dang it. Oh, hey. One plus C, one minus C. So it was one minus C down here? Yes. All right, that. that maps. And, and so I bet I had an, you guys just agreed with me that it mapped to I. I'm pretty sure that the one I had up there a second ago actually mapped to minus I, but you guys didn't check me on it. <laughs> Especially you. What, what about me? You're close. <laughs> Your closest. Your closest. I'm gonna tell Sprano. <laughs> oh, don't tell Sprano. <laughs> I'm teaching in his class tomorrow. Definitely gonna tell Sprano. <laughs> All right. So, um, anyway, if I've done this right, the interior of this should map to that. Now, I, I earlier today when I was 
unconvinced of these arguments, what I did to check on things with Ernesto was I looked at f of e to the i theta, and that gave me, you know, um, e to the i theta plus 1 over 1 minus e to the i theta, which you can rewrite as e to the i theta over 2 plus e to the minus i theta over 2 divided by e to the um, minus i theta over 2 minus e to the i theta over 2, which by the way is the cosine of theta over 2 divided by i uh, minus i times the sine of theta over 2, which is equal to, by the way, i times the cotangent of theta over 2. Which I liked because um, it's just manifest that, um, how's cotangent behave? It's always decreasing and it looks something kind of sort of like this. All right, here's your zero, here's your pi. So what's going on? As we input, as we look at, so like here is theta equals to zero, over here is theta equals to pi, just to check on things. Um, so how's that go? Oh, wait a minute, did I do that right? Oh, but it's theta over 2. I'm a dummy. Theta over 2. So I'm not looking at all of this. Um, if theta goes from 0 to pi, then this just goes from 0 to pi over 2, which means all of this down here is error relevant. So we're just looking at that in terms of this function. And so, like, it's, it's 0 when you get to, to pi, and it's it's infinity when you're close to zero, which means one maps to infinity, like I already know, and the minus one maps to zero, yay. But the larger point here is this is explicit evidence, right, that this Mobius transformation maps to the, uh, to the imaginary axis, right? All right, so you, you guys could have come to this faster, but th the point is that we've got this, we've got this lovely Mobius transformation, and then how do you, you, you want to solve in the w plane over here, Laplace's equation, you want, you want to have psi equal to 1 up here, you want to have psi equal to 0 down here, how do you do it? Psi of w is equal to, um, well, uh, 2 over pi, arg, arg w, right? That does it. Do you see it? Because when I plug in zero, excuse me, when I plug in any positive thing on the, on the real axis in the W plane, the angle zero, psi of that is zero. If I'm on the imaginary axis, my angle is pi over two. Pi over two times two over pi gives me one. So what's my actual solution to the original problem? Here it is, psi of z is two over pi times arg of z plus 1 over 1 minus z. That solves Laplace's equation on that half disk. Sorry, I seem to have done one of your homework problems. You'll forgive me, yes? Okay. The next problem, I may have assigned this next problem, I think is the quarter disk. What do you do there? Actually, I don't, this isn't quite the same problem, right? So, but let me work a problem like this one. Uh, telling Sprano, Sprano's going to hear about that, I'll tell you what. He knows when you've been naughty, he knows when you've been nice. Watch out.